thank you for coming here. Uh, thank you for joining us. And um, before I introduce David, I want to thank Bernu.live for hosting this event with us. Um, so today we have a special guest, David Heinemeyer Hansen. I hope I'm saying this right. Uh, he's the creator of Ruby on Rails, best-selling author. He uh, published WeWork. He doesn't have to be crazy at work. Remote office not required, and more books. He's a city of hey.com, base camp. Um, he's an advocate for work-life balance, a passionate car, a race car driver, a father of three boys, um, and probably much more than that. But uh, today, David will share his unique insight on being a CTO, a programmer, and more. So uh, join me in welcoming David uh, today. Well, thank you. So um, yeah, let's start with the first question. Um, looking at your role as a CTO, uh, can you explain us how did that start and uh, how did that role uh, evolve over time? Sure. So it started by the fact that I was the only developer at 37 Signals when we converted to becoming a software company. The company was originally founded as a web design company. And in 2003, we started work on Basecamp, our first uh, SaaS product, major SaaS project. We had done some small experiments before that. We released that in 2004. And after about a year, it was doing enough business that we could convert the consultancy into a product company. And I'd built Basecamp. Um, during the same time, I also built Ruby on Rails and started essentially as the one person who did everything. I was wearing all the technical hats. I was uh, setting up servers. I was doing the programming. I was doing all the on-call. I was doing everything. And then in 2005, we started hiring people at the company. And then the sort of CTO role became more than just lead developer or lead technical person. It also became manager of a technical team which has grown then over the past 20 years to today, we're, I don't know, 65, 67 people at the company, something like that. And we have a technical team of, uh, let's see, maybe 35, something like that. If you count everyone on the operation side, native development and uh, Ruby development. And um, that was kind of a, a slow evolution. We grew very slowly in the start. There are plenty of entrepreneurs who have this story about going, in 18 months, we went from two programmers to 200 and, and whatever. We didn't do that. Um, I got a very gradual, very kind introduction into the management role because it happened quite slowly. And I also did have some backing in the fact that my degree is in computer science and business administration. I got a lot of uh, indoctrination in organizational theory and so on from the Copenhagen Business School, a degree I finished in 2005. And... Um, yeah, so it was sort of a slow, slow move. I mean, I got to hire a programmer one at a time for quite a long time. We stayed a very small company for many years. Uh, I think after maybe four years, we were like eight or nine at the company. And then a few years later, things took off more rapidly. But um, that meant that the entire time, both before when I had to and then after, I've remained very hands on. I love writing code. I still write a lot of code. I review a lot of code. Um, so even at our size, and, and we've been slightly larger than we are now, I think we've had maybe 80 people at our peak. Uh, management was never a full-time job for me. So for me, CTO always meant kind of the same thing that general used to mean in like ancient Greek, that you don't just put down the strategy. No, no, no. You're on the front line with the cavalry and you go like, let's go, we're charging. And I know that that's not a typical style, certainly for most companies who grow just a little bit larger. They um, have a separation there where CTOing or other senior executive roles become full-time management roles. I've resisted that in part because like, that's just not what I enjoy doing mostly. I really enjoy making things myself. And I also find that to be an actually fairly effective leadership style. It's easy to get people to follow your vision if you're willing to be on the front line and your ideas about architecture or whatever come to fruition by your own hand and your own frustration. It's a good feedback loop to be right in the mix of things. Fully recognize that doesn't work for everyone, um, but we've been able to do quite a lot of things, both on the product side, on the infrastructure side, on general uh, influence on the industry with a really small team. So at least we can be one example of proving like that's possible. You could be a CTO of a team of 30 people and still code. 
That's totally possible, doable. You got to configure your environment, your life, your setup, your company in a way that supports that. You can't both have a full calendar with back-to-back -back meetings every goddamn day and then also do the developer thing. Um, but um, it doesn't have to be like that. You don't have to have fucking calendars full of meetings. Like those are very optional. And I find, I treat them for me as more optional than the programming part, the implementation part, that the, the leadership division, the executive direction I'm able to set by writing actual lines of code, I often find are more impactful, more convincing than when I pontificate, when I write down like, we should do this, we should do that. Sometimes you gotta do that too. You can't do everything yourself and you're not gonna have a lot of impact in many cases if you try to. But um, I do think you should do some things yourself. How did you learn being a manager? Did, did you uh, read resources? Were there anything that really struck you or was it a gradual learning through um, time? The best education I ever got in management was working for bad bosses. I recommend anyone who has an interest in management to work for some terrible bosses. No one will deliver the lessons in quite the visceral way as when you have a boss who impose policies or directions on you that you disagree with and preferably even find this tasteful. It really leaves a mark. I have all these vivid memories of specific instances working for what I considered at the time. I've, I've become a little more large in my assessment later years, but let's say terrible bosses at the time I, are very instructive lessons. And I had a really good combo of I finished high school when I was like 18, 19. And then I went to work in the Internet industry for three years before I went to business school. So by the time I started learning Shine and the other organizational theorists, I had a foundation of practical experience with management because I had been an employee in the specific industry I was going to work in, working for other people. And I was so it made all the theory very applicable. I could see like, oh, yeah, this is why that model. And I think, unfortunately, especially in America, it's very common that someone goes straight from high school to college and then they learn a bunch of theories about organizational theory and they don't have a uh, context of reality to kind of square that against. And therefore, the lessons are not very effective. And then if they're very unfortunate, they go straight from college and then they become a leader themselves. So they skip over the whole point or part of working for someone else. And I think that's a great travesty. I think many of the worst leaders are not good leaders because they've never worked for another leader. They've never worked for another boss. And it's not that, I mean, you can take positive examples, but I actually find that the negative examples are more valuable. Um, either way, unless you've worked for someone else, I think it's difficult to put yourself in the shoes of an employee. And that's what I try to do whenever we have whatever, discussions about policy or how to go, is to think of like, okay, I'm rewinding the clock here. I'm 21. I'm working for someone else. They come out and say this shit. What would I, how would I respond to that? Would I think that sounds reasonable? Or would I think like, that sounds like bullshit? And then very often that internal monologue or even shared monologue I'll have with Jason where I'm relaying these things is the iterative process that allows us to keep the worst bullshit out of it. Because I do think that you are fundamentally in a different class um, once you are a manager, and it's very easy to become divorced from the reality of people working underneath you. And it's very easy to start thinking of them as resources or other things rather than as people. And if you do that, you don't have the psychological insight into how your decisions are gonna hit. And if you don't know how your decision is gonna hit, they're not going to be very effective. Like you can have all the greatest plans in the world. If you have plans for other people and they don't find you credible or they don't find you believable, um, they're not going to do it. They're going to do it poorly. So um, it was really a, a journey of working for other people, then getting some theory, then getting the opportunity to work for myself as it is. At a small company, grow slowly, and treat everything from first principles. This was the other thing. Having worked from a, a range of companies, I wanted to revisit every single thing that was a best practice. It may be 
It's not like I'm going to invent the deep dish on every single topic, but I want to leave the door open that everything I've been exposed to, like this is the way we do things around here, that that could be bullshit, that that might have applied in a different context, is no longer relevant or whatever else have you. And we're going to find the path for our company from first principles, from being skeptical about everything that has come as received. And sometimes we're wrong. I have plenty of examples about that we can talk about. Um, but oftentimes we're also right because we're applying first principle thinking to the context as it looks today with the people we have and all that kind of stuff. I see a, a lot of people uh, relating to working for bad bosses in the comments. Uh, so <laughs> nothing I think will also give you the humility as doing that. And I think maybe that's the one thing that took me a little bit longer to realize. Like I have this memory of working for a quote unquote bad boss, right? Now I've seen more things. I've been in more situations and I guarantee you, I have plenty of people now um, who've worked for me who have that assessment of me that I was the bad boss. Like I made a bad decision or whatever else. Um, and having the humility that, you know what, that's part of the deal that to some extent being a boss means embracing the reality that not everyone's going to love you every single time for every decision you ever make. And you can't control other people's assessment of it. You can try to put yourself in their shoes, see it from their perspective. And then sometimes you can go like, do you know what? These perspectives are at odds. The thing that the employee would most like is not necessarily the same thing as what's the right thing to do for the business. And I find like what's interesting to me is when those things are in conflict, when it's not, there's not like you can't just keep crunching the inputs until you find the correct answer. You realize that it's a it's a trade off. And sometimes the things that employee want um, that makes sense from their perspective and their vantage point. But it's not the same thing as what's right for the business at large. And I think that uh, having that humility and that realization that you cannot always be like the the perfect boss from the perspective of an employee is also very valuable and you need to internalize that without becoming a cold heartless asshole who just thinks whatever they say is always right and it's actually a, a verification of your correctness if employees don't like it there are pathological cases like that who fall in love with that part of it and you got to live in the space where both things exist where you're both seeing it from the employee's perspective and you're also zooming out and seeing it from the larger perspective of the business. And it's not easy. And there's no like perfect path here to, uh, oops, sorry, I turned the thing down. There's no perfect path to resolve all the conflicts. There are inherent conflicts in the employee employer relationship that cannot be fundamentally solved, they can only be managed. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the size of your team. It, it's, it's relatively small, um, 30 developers and 65 people in total. What, what are the biggest advantages that you see and some of the cha challenges um, to building products that uh, you faced? Yeah, I think even, even, even the 30 people is overstating it. I mean, uh, of those 10 of them work in operations. They're not developers in the traditional sense. They manage our servers and, and uptime and so on. It's even much smaller than that. When we work on products, let's take Basecamp. Basecamp is our biggest, longest running product. The product team, as it is, um, consists of currently three programmers. Wow. Three programmers and then three designers. And sometimes that's two programmers and two designers. And that's the, that's the team working on new feature development for the web. And the web really encompasses most of the platforms because we use a hybrid strategy. Um, we do have other developers. We have developers doing what we call SIP, security infrastructure and performance, um, keeping up with CVR or CVEs and, and other things. And you could say like, that's also part of it. But in terms of the user facing experience of being a Basecamp customer, what they see is primarily the work of say three programmers, three programmers moving the ball forward. Now that is a very small team and the vast majority of work in terms of features that we do is made by one programmer, one programmer, one designer. That's the standard team size we have. Uh, one programmer, one designer, they're responsible for introducing entirely new features. One of the mo major ones we uh, did lately was essentially like we took a version of Kanban, as people might know it from Trello or otherwise, and we 
poured that down into a feature. We put that into the product. That was the work of one programmer. Um, so we, because in part of where we came from, I mean, I built all the base game by myself on the technical side, right? That was the initial version of it. We then stayed very small for a long period of time. We built Ruby on Rails. We've really been trying to optimize our processes for incredibly lean teams because I find the, um, all the fun things for me happen in small teams. Like um, the, the, the few moments where I go like, do you know what? I don't like working here is whenever I'm called into a meeting with more than five people. I go like, we're fucking too big. If somehow we can have a goddamn meeting that needs four, more than five people, something has gone wrong somewhere along the way. There are too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, what's up? We've got to fix it. And then we fix it usually in a way of reducing the number of people who are involved in a certain decision or in a certain project and finding a way to make those people more efficient, give them more leverage to deliver more value quicker. One of the specific uh, angles where that has been difficult over time has been with native app development. Um, there's probably plenty of people who can relate to that. Working with the native materials of uh, mobile phones is a uh, cumbersome difficult and slow process when you compare it to working with the web. And there we need a little bit of a different tactic to some degree, but we've tried to disengage the wheels as we like to call it. When you have, for example, work that happens on the web, we release a new feature for Basecamp. If that, had to, if that every time has to synchronously match up with a native team that then also makes native apps, you have um, possibility for grinding gears. Like someone's working on this and now they got to wait for some other team that delivers this and the, I don't like that at all. So we try very hard to take those gears and then separate them so that they can spin freely. So we can have a web team that's spinning and releasing features. And then we have a mobile team that runs on its own schedule and its own priorities, optimizations, who may pick up some of the web features that get pushed out and adorn them in a progressive enhancement kind of way, but they don't have to. The web team can ship things that hit the native apps completely independently of native programmers working on things over there. That to me has been one of the major projects we've had to be able to have such small teams because the more coordination you need, the more overhead you need when you're trying to coordinate with, again, let's use this example of the web and native, the more cumbersome things become, the more needed meetings you need, the more coordination, the more, uh, whatever difficulties of sort of just a network, the more you increase the likelihood that that meeting is going to have more than five participants. Um, so that's been a big driver of trying to work this way. Um, I mean, I have just also a personal intense distaste for meetings for a full calendar. Like my personal calendar um, looks the best when it's virtually empty. That is my preferred default state. I don't always get to get everything I want, but I, I would be surprised if I was to compare my calendar with most people, even at substantially smaller companies, they would be shocked how little synchronous coordination work that I do. That is time and a place and a set of specifically invited individuals. And we discuss whatever the matters of the day. I don't do very much of that. We do almost all, not all, let's say 90% of our coordination work is asynchronous remotely and written. And I think that is probably the biggest key that I see that isn't replicated in other organizations and why we're able to have such an outsized capacity to deliver value with such small teams, because we leave programmers, designers, product teams, the hell alone, the vast majority of the time we have the majority of developers, if we take that as an example, will have one, maybe two half hour meetings a week. That's it. There are no daily standups. There are no check-ins with your PM. There are no fucking frivolous one-on-ones constantly. Like we've taken all of that shit and we've flushed it down the toilet. And what we've left is huge chunks of uninterrupted time. And it is truly remarkable how productive a single programmer can be if you leave them the fuck alone. If you just give them eight hours in a given day to work on the problems that are exciting and interesting to them, they will yield results that teams of 20 will struggle to replicate. 
Thank you. Um, we have a question from Dominic. Um, do you give equity participation? How do you incentivize uh, team members uh, within your team? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, first, it's just no. We do not give out equity to, to team members, never have. The company is owned by uh, Jason and I and the Bezos estate that's now split into two minority parts. But it essentially has, in practical terms, two owners that are also operators. That is Jason and I. Um, but what we have instead is um, a package that is very attractive, in my opinion, um, especially since we hire on a worldwide basis, including Europe, where we peg our salaries to the top 10 percentile of San Francisco salaries. Um, we have a profit sharing program where we take 10% of the yearly profits and distribute to employees according to seniority. And if you take just that on the financial side of things, that's a very appealing package. I mean, I'm confident that we're in the top 1% terms on financial packages to programmers and designers in Europe for that. I mean, we're anchored in the US, but we hire internationally and specifically in Europe. Um, we pay exceptionally well. What we don't do and what this not, does not include is a, is a lottery ticket. And I am full respect for people who go like, do you know what? Actually, that would, that's what I would like. I would like a lottery ticket where by picking the correct company at the direct time, I can become a multimillionaire as a individual contributor programmer. That is not an option at our company. Um, but we kind of, uh, first of all, find that there are plenty of people who are not interested in buying lottery tickets with their career. And they're not willing to do the trade-offs that that usually include, which is to work in very high intensity, very high stress startup environments where you have to, whatever, quadruple the size of the company every 18 months and rate, raise untold amount of money to do it. And then we also get to work in this very funky, queer, uh, queer, uh, quirky uh, <laughs> manner of, um, of, of working for someone who owns the company. The vast majority of people who work in the technology people or technology industry do not work for people who own the company. They work for intermediary agents who uh, have sold large parts of the company to VCs or, or professional managers or, or whatever. And the kind of immediacy and response you can get, um, I sometimes think about it like a throttle response. Um, the, some of the best cars in the world, like the Carrera GT or um, the Lexus LFA, they're um, heralded and beloved because the throttle response is incredibly quick. They have very light flywheel. So the immediacy of pressing the throttle and seeing the revs just, just go up on the tachometer, it's just intoxicating. That's what it's like to work at 37 signals to some extent. There's a very short distance, very small flywheel between a programmer complaining about something, me being aware of it, and me being able to effectuate change. We don't have a lot of intermediary linkages and layers. In fact, on the product side, we have zero professional managers. There is no full-time managers. There's no professional managers in the traditional sense of the word. There's no uh, project managers. Everything is, it's not a flat structure. There are team leads, but those team leads are in themselves individual contributors. And they are team leads because they're the best individual contributors. And then there's me, who's also an individual contributor, and then who's, who's ultimately sort of able to affect change in all the regards. The totality of that package um, is highly competitive. And we frankly don't need to offer equity. And to offer equity also, to some extent, sets the expectation that what this is, is a vehicle for a sale, right? The way you exercise equity, or realize the, the benefits of it is to sell those stakes. And sometimes it happens sort of en masse in, in an exit event, you go public, you do whatever, and then you sell all that equity. Or in my opinion, it happens even worse that you hand out equity that people have vested, and then those people sell it to whoever the fuck wants to buy it. And then suddenly your company is owned by a bunch of strangers um, who you have no relation to. And hey, there's a version of that that's the total success of capitalism. This is how we get stakeholder capitalism. This is how we get capital markets. It can achieve wonderful, beautiful things. In a company of 60, 
where I don't want to ask anyone for permission and I want to do exactly whatever the fuck I want to do any day of the week, that's a poor model. That's a poor mix, right? Like we don't have a board. There's no board at 37 Signals. Um, Jason and I just, the vast majority of even highly consequential decisions are made in like blocks of two minutes deliberation. Jason shoots me a message on Signal. It's like, hey, what do you think uh, about raising our prices? Well, I don't know. Sounds good. Let's do it. Decision done, over, effectuated. The next day, we're doing it. That level of throttle response as an organization is, is not just intoxicating, it's actually addictive. And I think I am, at this point, unemployable in a situation with a lazy flywheel. And you know what? Again, that has trade-offs. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you can find former employees of mine who will go like, yeah, that's why they suck. Um, they don't have a board. There's no checks and balances. There's no moderating forces. Um, they just do a bunch of crazy shit all the time. And, so, and not all of it works. And some things that I worked on didn't work or whatever. And I go like, you are correct, sir. That is absolutely right. This is not a model for the entire world. Um, but you know what? Wouldn't the world of automotive suck if all of us had to drive a fucking Prius? Like, we need the fucking LFAs of the world. We need the Courage ETs of the world. Um, if for nothing else, just like to prove what's possible with human diversity of organization, right? Like, we can't all just fit into the, into the same boxes. And there's many other variations. And I mean, I've been highly critical, for example, of most VC constructions. But that is a very viable alternative. And the world is richer because those things exist. I don't want every company in the world to run like 37 signals. I think we'd all go crazy. Um, I do want some of the companies to run like that. And that's why we run it the way we do. Uh, this is a great door. I think um, we're talking to uh, YC companies here. And a lot of them have a standard of like going to YC and then having demo day raising money. Um, I know you yes. have very strong opinions on raising money. And uh, yes. I'm going to bring this up. Um, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about like VC boosted companies versus, um, I don't know if we can call yourself a lifestyle business, but like, um, Oh, we can. Yeah. No, let's do that. Yeah. Let, let's call okay. it lifestyle because I fucking love that term and I love it <laughs> because the people who call our style of business, a lifestyle business usually do so in a derogatory way. It is a way to put down or diminish our sense of ambition. That like, oh, that's cute. Oh, you're running a lifestyle business. <laughs> that's cute, right? Because they have this concept in their head that unless you raise tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, you can have no impact on a broad scale, whether it's with customers or the industry or otherwise. And I live to disprove that nonsense. I live to disprove it. I love it. I absolutely <laughs> love when people go like, oh, that's cute lifestyle business. And I go like, do you want to fucking compare CVs? Do you want to compare accomplishments or lasting impacts on our industry? Go ahead. Let's do that. Sounds fun. Um, and I feel very confident in our CV. I feel very confident in our list of accomplishments, even though I don't give a fuck about the competition. I, I mean, nothing is uh, removed from my experience of business or the world or life from knowing that someone somewhere else did something that resulted in them being worth more in whatever valuation that we are. Great, fine. Like, what more could I ask for? We've been able to run this company for 20 years plus, doing whatever the hell we wanted, whenever the hell we wanted, literally making hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue over those years, taking a very large chunk of that and keeping it as profits and distributions. And like, that's a lifestyle business in, though, in some universe that that's bad. What? Like. If you are to compare um, sort of the affordances of how we run our business and the freedoms we have, the, um, the lack of a board, the lack of outside funding, the lack of someone else telling us where to go, I think most entrepreneurs would resonate with that and go like, yeah, that sounds nice. I'd fucking love to get rid of my goddamn board it was full of VC stooges who only care about quarterly results and 40% year over year and all the other bullshit and, and return to just doubling down on what I believe is true, but cannot necessarily always articulate in charts and graphs. Um, so yeah, I love lifestyle business as a term. Now that doesn't mean that everyone can 
in the sense that like, A, there exists classes of companies who simply require large amounts of capital, especially if they are dealing in physical goods. If you need to produce physical objects, especially hardware, um, you need to do that before you can sell it. In most cases, although Kickstarter has sort of changed the dynamics a little bit, but um, let's just accept the premise that some businesses do require starting capital that is beyond the reach of what single individuals usually have access to. Um, great, let's raise money for those. For the software primary companies or software only companies, I find it, I was about to say silly, that's not true. I find it um, much less convincing that VC money is necessary. And I find the laundry list of examples of where it went badly astray infinite. The number of companies who raised large sums of money, hired way too many people way too quickly, ended up with those 20 programmer teams producing less than a single um, expert developer could do is the norm. The norm in our VC industry, so certainly prior to the peak of 2021, this is the other thing. Technology and funding cycles work on such a long time frame that most individuals who are currently in the industry have seen nothing else. They've seen nothing else than just like the past era. They weren't there prior to 2008, for example. So they only saw the bull run that started in 2008 and ended in 2021, right? Which was money is essentially free. You can raise as much of it as you like. Um, VCs don't care about cost at all. They actually want you to spend as much money as you can uh, as quickly as possible to get on to the next funding round and, and so on and so forth. If you've been bred purely within the context of such an, uh, a long run um, boom cycle, yeah, you're going to end up with certain precepts and knowledge about what reality looks like that is um, limited, let's say. Like this is one of the few advantages, and there are several disadvantages, but one of the few advantages of growing old, <laughs> of having been around for more than one cycle. Like I was around for the original dot-com boom and bust cycle, and then there was a very long fallow period where no one could raise money for anything. I mean, expert developers changed careers because there was literally no place to get hired in 20 or 2002, right? Um, we're entering, I don't know if it's going to be as harsh of a landing. It probably isn't because tech is so much larger than what it was. But it is for some people right now, it is a hard landing. It's a hard landing to go from the bull run that was 2008 to 2021 Q4 to the reality of 2024 going like, holy shit, I mean, I can't even get a callback. I'm talking about individual contributors here. I can't even get a callback. I'm a senior tenured developer who was principal staff at this other company. Now I can't get the uh, recruiters to call me back. Or you're an entrepreneur who, who raced your last round in 2021 and you try to go back to the market now. And uh, I just say, um, I hope you're wearing a winter coat. It's awfully cold up there. It's awfully cold. It's not impossible and companies are getting funded, especially if you somehow can find an angle that says AI, then um, uh, the wallets are open. But tons of companies, again, were nurtured in an environment where it was very easy to raise large sums of money. And then suddenly, almost what seemed in the blink of an eye, the environment changed and it's not very difficult. Um, so I have a general objective or had and still have a general objective for entrepreneurship. I want independence. That's probably the most important value of, of all the values that I hold dear for entrepreneurship. And I want some degree of financial success. What I found is that sometimes these two things are in conflict and you end up trading off one for the other at the incorrect levels. What I've found from my personal experience is that, um, maybe this is starting to get a little dated, but the, the largest step function in wealth happens with the first step. You go from the zero dollars in your bank account to you have a million euros in your bank account. It's a very large step function. Like a whole swath of normal human problems simply evaporate once you have like a clean million euros in your bank account and you don't give a fuck what grocery costs anymore, right? That's really a lot of value. And then let's say there's another step function between a million euros and 10 million euros. It's also substantial. Suddenly you can buy a house and barely think about it and just buy it outright. And then it tapers off incredibly quickly. The difference between having, let's say, 10 million euros of liquid funds and having 50 million euros of liquid funds, it's very modest, actually. I mean, instead of just buying a 911 without looking at it, maybe you're buying a, a Ferrari. Not that different. 
911 is actually a better car in many instances than a Ferrari. Um, <laughs> there's some status gains perhaps at that level, but you can do most of the things you want to do at 10 million that you can do at 50. And then the jump between 50 and 100 is almost non-existent. There's almost nothing you can do more. Maybe you can buy a jet um, and that's nice, but like there's not, it doesn't give access to a lot of other things. So what I think when I look at a step function like that is I want to optimize my chances to hit the largest step function. So what are the odds? What do I have to do as an entrepreneur to reach the first step function? Get a million euros on my bank account clean. Is that the same thing as trying to optimize for becoming a billionaire? No, it's not. In fact, they are very much in opposition. The billionaire shot is in many cases a very long shot. The rewards are, I was about to say they're wonderful. I don't actually believe that's true. I know a fair number of billionaires. To large degrees, their lives kind of suck. Most of them have full-time security uh, details that follow them everywhere. Um, I don't envy most billionaires that I know. Some of that I'm sure is sour grapes. And if I had a fucking 300 yard yacht that could just go anywhere in the world, I'd probably go like, that's pretty cool. And fucking two helicopters <laughs> that can land on it. That sounds kind of neat too. But the trade-offs at that level, they're not totally obvious. Versus the trade-off between having $0 in your bank account and 10 million, no one's going to, well, I wouldn't say no one. Very few people are going to go like, yeah, I prefer the zero euro version of that, right? Um, so anyway, step functions, they're, they're non-linear. They happen in big jumps and they're different strategies to pursue for hitting different ones of them. And the strategy you would pursue to hit a, a million euro or 10 million euro is often quite different if you want to optimize your odds for hitting a larger one. Like 10 million euros, for example, um, you can have a, a company that let's say gross is just a million euros, let's say 2 million euros because you have a partner and you split the equal. 2 million euros a year, right? That's a very small business. I mean, the grand scheme of things, right? 2 million euros a year in profit and you run that business for 10 years, voila, 10 million, right? Like that kind of math I find is, is not a common, common thing that people do. What they do do a lot of times is, is they buy into the VC premise. Would you rather want a small slice of a very big pie, right? And actually I would go like, no, I don't. A very big pie where I have a very small slice is a pie I have very little control over. Like it's crumbs in terms of independence and power to set direction. If I own the whole fucking pie, it doesn't actually have to be very big for me to have full independence and to achieve the step functions of wealth that are possible or, or highly desirable, I should say. Um, so it's funny because I love those examples of a lifestyle business. Someone says that derogatorily. I go, yes. So we can agree, like a person could say it negatively about me and I can go positively affirming it. Like I, I love those kind of um, unbalance. And the small pie, big pie uh, metaphor is the same way. I want the small pie, but I want to have all of it. Um, all right, that was a long answer to a simple question. <laughs> no, that, that was great. I think we should make a graph of uh, what you just said, uh, a visual at least. Um, I tried to do that in 2007. I spoke at Y Combinator's second or third inaugural demo day or whatever they were calling it back then. I was invited to, to speak there. The presentation is still online. I think it's called... Uh, how to run a small Italian restaurant or something like that. And I made all these points and there was a graph in there. I don't know if the slides have survived, but I've literally been making this point for like 20 years. Um, and, and what's interesting to me with that point is like, it doesn't, um, people can intellectually understand it and then still go like, yeah, no, all right, I'll, I'll have the small piece, please. <laughs> it, it's not a common, it's not a common uh, path to be taken. Let's just say that. Thank you. Um for that uh, detailed answer. Maybe we can switch a uh, topic and talk about uh, how you see the future, especially in AI. So first of all, do you use ChatGPT or like any LLM? Um, how often do you use them? And how do you see like AI automating software engineers, programmers uh, soon? Great questions. Um, first, I use ChatGPT every day certainly when I'm programming. Um, and I use it as a, as a pair programmer who doesn't get to drive. I want to type it all. 
I don't actually like the auto-completing uh, LLMs. I don't like Copilot in that sense. I don't even like fucking, and one of the things that radicalized me, I don't know, radicalized me, but um, contributed to the inspiration of creating hey.com was uh, Gmail auto-completion. And it wasn't auto-completion of words, it was auto-completion of sentences. That to me is a tipping point where suddenly, I'm not just letting the machine finish my thoughts, I'm letting the machine run my thoughts, like actually structure my thinking. And I thought like, do you know what? I don't like this at all. And I say that as someone who loves what's happening. AI to me is probably the most amazing thing or innovation that's happened in my career since the internet. I mean, let's see if it's gonna be bigger than the internet, but like the last time I felt this excited about fundamental core progress was the internet itself. And that was like discovering it in like 95. Um, so really exciting. I'm totally on team progress. I'm totally on team full throttle. And I'm dismayed that the EU seemed to somehow fucking revel in an idea that they're gonna do nothing but regulate this stuff. That just seems tragic, like end of empire, tomfoolery. Um, so I love the fact that all this stuff is happening. Um, and if you were, you know, so, so here comes the trouble, right? AI in its modern understanding is two years old, right? Like this is two years of chat GTP, two years of mid journey, two years of most of the tooling that has animated people's ideas. In those two years, they've set points on a graph for progress that are incredible. I mean, you look at Midjourney V1 and you see these fucking freaks with seven fingers and they look like these distorted nightmares. And you look at Midjourney V6 and you go like, I, I can't tell, this isn't a real photograph. And I'm like, I, I have photography as a hobby. Like I know what to look for. I fucking can't tell. Are you telling me this person is not real? How is that even possible? How is it possible that this face that looks so human is not a human? Um, so here you have these data points, right? And then the thing that humans do every single time, they extrapolate from the set of data points that they have. And if you were just to chart through the points on the graph, right? The fucking thing is exponential. Like if you were to chart between that, like in two years, we're going to have AGI and like either we're going to have Skynet or we're going to have Utopia. Um, robots is just going to fucking do everything. And um, that's a very dangerous place to be for future predictions. When you have that short of a time frame, and that actually, it's not that you have few data points. We have a lot of data points. It actually makes it even more dangerous because it looks like your line is even more accurate. But it's, it's built on two years. That's not enough time. And um, one of my favorite conference talks of all times was um, the guy from Pinboard. I forget what his name is. He gave a presentation about the progress in internet, whatever. And the parallel he drew was a flight. So we went from the Wright brothers fucking doing flight at the beginning of the 20th century to them being involved to some extent in World War I as curiosities, then just whatever, 20 years later, we fucking have full on Messerschmitts and Spitfires. A few years after that, we have, well, actually towards the end of World War I, we get fucking jet fighters. I mean, check that, that, that is short duration <laughs> from like, literally we don't believe humans can ever fly. I, if you look back on some of the early coverage of the Wright brothers, you could see like articles literally written like three months early. It'll be 10,000 years before humans will take flight, right? So the predictions were just totally wrong. And you go from this riggedy thing that's barely flying and like World War II, we have jet fighters, 40 years. Um, that's on a human time scale, very short still. It's not two years, but it's still short. And then you get, um, you get the, the first Boeing designs and, and so on in the 50s. And again, if you were to chart the graph, you'd go like, man, by 2022, we must have super subsonic mecha jets that can get me from, from Australia to LA in two hours. Surely we must be able to run at Mark five. And it didn't happen. Like literally modern aviation stopped posting fundamental progress in like, I think late sixties. If you compare a uh, 
modern airliner to the design from late 60s. First of all, in, in many cases, including the Boeing um, 737 and 747, they're direct descendants of a 1957 design. Like the, the hull is actually the same and so on. We've, we've tipped the wings a little bit. We've improved the efficiency of the Rolls-Royce engines. They can go slightly longer on fuel. No fundamental jumps. They fly at the same speed. They're barely any faster than a fucking plane that flew 60 years ago. It leveled off. Um, more modern example, self-driving cars. In 2017, Elon Musk and a bunch of other people went like, by the end of the year, personal driving will be obsolete. Everyone will be floating around in a robot fleet of taxis. You're actually probably a little stupid if you're buying a car right now because like, it's going to be obsolete in about five minutes. That didn't happen, right? It turned out that uh, making self-driving cars is a difficult problem. And even Elon Musk couldn't solve it in like two years, five years, seven years. We're actually not that close. Notwithstanding that we might not eventually perhaps get there, also entirely possible we won't. Final example, uh, Van Neumann, one of the inventors of literally the computer as we know it, right? In, in 1955, uh, I believe it was. He gives an interview and he says something like, we're going to have general intelligence in like three or four years. With 1955 technology, the smartest person in computers, perhaps one of the smartest people in sort of the evolution of science that has ever lived, believed we were four years away from AGI. Oh, yeah. It's very difficult to predict the future. It's very difficult to draw the line outside the dots you already have. And humans, time and again, have been laughably wrong in both directions. In 1890, someone would think it's 10,000 years before we have flight. And in, in, in um, whatever, 1968, someone believes we're all going to be flying around on Mark V jets in 40 years, right? We're just, we're laughably terrible at predicting the future. Um, so I try not to do that. What I try to do is follow um, William Gibson's idea of, of the future. Or, or, or more f uh, uh, foolproof way of predicting the future. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. That's the kind of prediction you can make. When the future actually exists, but it hasn't, gone all the ways, done all the distribution, then you can predict the future. Um, I think every single developer within two years is going to use an LLM to do their work. And I think anyone who does not is going to be at a severe disadvantage. Now, are they still going to be writing the code themselves? I have no fucking idea. No fucking idea. I mean, actually, there's a whole historical uh, look back there on um, uh, no code. No code was the last time we had this. This was in 2012, I think, the no code movement started. And a bunch of startups were like, yeah, in five years, no one will be writing software anymore. No code was just the, I think, fourth or fifth generation of essentially, um, we're not going to write code anymore. When I got started in the, in, the, in the 90s, we had a no code movement. And people believed we were five years away from not writing code. None of those movements came to pass. Right, people are still writing code. They're writing more code than ever. It's more complicated than ever. So actually, if you just look at those data points, you'd go like, no LLMs are going to fail because we've tried like five times before to go no code. It didn't work. Um, but I try not to actually predict the future, only extrapolate it. All right, again, sorry, long answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love it. Well, I think everybody's enjoying it. I'm, I'm looking at the comments at the same time and uh, a lot of people are reacting. So yeah, thank you. Um, let's talk a bit about the, the product that you're recently launching. Um, I'm bringing this comment, but um, yeah, what is your plan for once? And you probably have um, metrics. And I'm curious to know like how that business economics is going for you selling like one of uh, $300 um, software. Um, I see that you're probably planning to release other versions that you would make people pay again, but they can still keep on that first version. Uh, so super curious to learn about this. Yeah, I'm also su super curious to learn about this because we are so early in the process that we don't know. Um, what we do know, or what I believe to be true, is that there's an opportunity. I don't know whether that opportunity is right now, in two years, in five years, or in 10. 
That's the part of predicting the futures is actually almost impossible. It's very difficult to time the markets. If you could time the markets, you didn't actually even need to do the work. You could just fucking buy out of the whatever money puts and you'd be golden. So timing the markets is very difficult, um, but I don't care. <laughs> we have earned the right to have fun and explore opportunities. And when I look at something like um, Slack subscriptions, it's, it's been my favorite one to pick on because they're so absurd. Um, there are organizations literally paying tens of thousands of dollars every month for Slack subscriptions. There's a tiny subset paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for a Slack subscription because they have a large organization and they're paying $15 per, um, per user. And if they're very proud of themselves, they've negotiated it down from $15 to $12. It's still absurd. Because if you look at the fundamentals of what that is, it's a chat system. Um, it's a very nice one. I think Slack is a good product. Um, I think it used to be a better product. I think it's been captured by its enterprise sales force. And you can see that if you open the, um, the preference tab, it is now a junk drawer of every single signed enterprise agreement where it would not get signed until they added some checkbox that was totally stupid and um, dedicated to just that customer. And now everyone else has to suffer through the mess that's at that. But let's just take it at its glory point. Great piece of software comes in. Um, and it hits the timing just right. I mean, at 37 Signals, we had a Slack like 10 years before Slack. I forget what year it was Slack really rose to prominence, maybe around 2015 or something. 2005, we released Campfire, a essential chat, uh, chat system on the same principle. This is IRC in the browser with, uh, with uh, archives and storage and, and all sorts of stuff, right? We timed the market. I was about to say wrong, but that implies that there's some, that I had any influence on it. You don't. That's the magic of business. You, you, you are blessed to be at the right time at the, at the right place. You still have to have a good product. Plenty of people will fail on that, but you can have a good product at the wrong time and it won't fucking matter. You will not get the results that a bad product at the right time will get. That's the real head noodle scratcher, right? That you can build something superior at the wrong time and that's worse for business outcome than to build something shitty at the right time. But Slack is not shitty. Slack is a good product. It is absurdly priced for the commodity utility that it offers. And when we started this and I looked at some of these bills, I went like, do you know what? We can literally launch a competitor that is 99.9% .9 cheaper. Like it can be so much cheaper, it sounds like a scam. And that's actually one of the main uphill battles we are struggling with right now that people don't believe this is possible. If you've been conditioned into thinking that having chat for your company is, is a product that should cost hundreds of dollars a month or thousands of dollars or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, you're simply not going to believe that you can buy that utility for a one-time fee of $300. Or I'm not saying you can't believe it. I'm saying it's difficult to believe it, which means that the success of once hinges on us re-educating an entire market into what's possible. That it's possible to create something like a Slack commodity that is virtually <laughs> as good for the things that most people need for literally less than 1% of the cost. That's a difficult sell because it has the problem of, of convincing someone of something that almost require them to look a little foolish in retrospect, right? You kind of like, if you buy, campfire our first product and you pay 300 bucks and it works you you need a certain constitution not to look yourself in the mirror and think what the fuck were we doing why were we paying thousands of dollars before this is nonsense right and i think that's a difficult psychological barrier so we're up against that um now that being said we're off to a great start we convinced well over a thousand customers to buy the product right out the gate for something that was built by a very small team, right? Our main insight was you could change the, the business model, you can change the distribution model, and we can explore that market for a low investment in terms of R&D. Again, uh, the Campfire product was built by two programmers, one designer who worked for maybe four months. That was the bulk of the investment into it, right? Like we did not invest millions of dollars. Building Hey, our email service, I mean, that took two years, fucking millions of dollars of investments to get there, right? That was a, that was a large uphill thing. Um, once is not that. Once is a relatively cheap experiment for us to test the market on like, where are we? And to actually provoke the market. Because I, I, I mean, I also just like that as a sport. I love to provoke 
uh, the market as a sport of like, just rethink some fundamentals, some first principles. Does every piece of software on the internet have to be subscription based? I don't think so. And I think we're seeing the early signs of us. Well, not even early signs. We're, we're actually well into the mainstream description of this problem of subscription fatigue, where companies go like, wait, why do we have fucking 80 subscriptions per employee? I forget what the standard number of subscriptions is for a mid-sized company, but it's like horrifying. It's horrifying. Like the number of, you're like, it's just $15. Yeah, times fucking 80 times all your employees. Suddenly that's like real money. Um, and I just think that there's a category of software that has entered commodity status and we have an obligation to produce generics. Do you know what? The international, the world uh, medicine market would work very poorly if we did not have generic providers of medicine that was off patent, right? Like we literally rely for the welfare of the world that the likes of FISA and Merck and whatever don't get to have a perpetual license on their drugs forever. They get 19 years. That's it. The patent has expired on Slack. It's ludicrous to pay on patent fees to continue to have that service. So we're providing a generic version um, that is, I was about to say infinite, but that's not true. 99 point up to 99.9% .9 cheaper, right? That's what generics can do. Um, so early stages have to retrain a whole market off to a good start, encouraged enough that we're already into production on, on the second product that we're going to do. We might well even do a third this year. Again, we're doing them relatively cheaply. We're not investing years and years of development and, and, and millions of dollars into them. We're doing them with small teams. We can move quickly. We can find markets. And I'm already seeing all the things I love to see when you have new markets, like the little, the little sparkles, the little, what do you call them? Little green sprouts. When we started Basecamp in 2004, we had to convince customers that it was safe to put a credit card into a form on the internet. That was one of the challenges we had. We had to convince our bank that it was safe for them <laughs> to allow us to take credit card payments for service that had not been rendered. That seemed risky. It took a long time for SaaS as a concept to win mainstream adoption from both service providers like banks and from customers. I was there. I saw how long it fucking took for us to build that business. So I have the, to some extent, the benefit of seeing that, and then I can apply that, um, but it's difficult. The hardest thing, and this is why the innovators dilemma exists. The hardest thing for an existing business with a winning profitable product is that anything new they start will look inconsequential, too small, too hard to bother. So they will double down on the things that already work right up until they don't, and then they'll go out of business. That's a, that's just a trap. I mean, you can read uh, Clayton Christensen on, on that. Um, I'd prefer to avoid that faith. Maybe it's not possible. But I'm going to try. And one of the reasons or one of the ways we're trying is we're trying something radically new that is totally different from SaaS. In some ways, it's, it's negation while we're trying something else. It's not been pulled off that often. I think the iPod to iPhone transition was probably one of the greatest examples of this, of self cannibalizing or even running the risk of it. Um, and I look at that as one of the main sources of inspiration for this. Thank you, David. Um, I think we're running out of time. Do, do you have time for one more question or Last uh, question. do you have yep. somewhere you need to go? Okay. Well, I have so a we have this question. Speed, but um, that's oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> we have this question from uh, Florent. Um, do you have any example of companies successfully migrating to your level of asynchronous communication? And uh, what would you advise to anyone wanting to do that? Great question. Um, yeah, as I said, I think asynchronous biased synchronization is not that everything needs to be it. Occasion is okay to have a meeting, especially if you have running situations where it needs to be diffused. Um, you can do that better either in person or, or video chat, but most things are not that or should not be that. You have a problem if it is. Um, should not be that. It, it is the greatest secret we have that we can't stop fucking talking about. And it, it amazes me that you can have this incredible proven productivity lever 
that then doesn't see widespread adoption until you have these crisis modes. Like everyone went to some extent to async. Actually, that's not fair. Um, more companies went to asynchronous uh, communication during the pandemic, right? But a lot of them also just replicated their in-person communication patterns and they just booked end-to-end -end Zoom meetings until everyone was ready to blow their brains out. Um, it's not easy to change the culture of a company. And that is not just about asynchronous communications, it's about everything. Like once you have an established company culture, it usually actually takes a crisis to materially get out of it. Now, not always true. Um, and one way it can happen sooner is when it's coming top down. It's very easy to, or very difficult to get bottom up cultural changes if there's not buy in from the top and there's not a crisis to service the accelerant. If there's a crisis, you can sometimes get miraculous changes done to a, an organization. But let's assume you're an organization that's running well, well enough, but you could run better. You could do more, you could be more productive, you could have every employee, whatever, if you switch to raising and Cronies work. First, got to convince the people who actually can tell people what to do or tell them that they're fired to put these things in change. And then say, we're going to try this. And then I would take something real and then I would run it like that. This next project, this next product, this next customer, we're going to try to run it like this. And we're going to go all in on this small subset of the business. And we're going to sign up for, say, Basecamp or another tool like it that is built for asynchronous communication. We're not going to do stand-ups. We're not going to do all the meetings. We're not going to do all the things. And it's going to be painful because uh, the reason it's difficult to change culture is that it's difficult to change habits. And it's difficult to change habits because people fall in love with their habits and they find them comforting and whatever. And once you try to change them, they feel like they're under threat and they're under challenge. There's a whole body of organizational theory about change agents and so forth is actually some of the stuff like shine and others have, uh, have, have documented and I got um, an education part of that. So I know why it's difficult, um, but I also know that it's possible. And um, I think this is what the best companies pull off. And the reason why it's so satisfying if you do is because it's not common. It is difficult to reconfigure organizations once they're in flight, but if you can pull it off, you can have a material advantage. So I would start the next project, not something fucking in the future. Uh, inspiration is perishable. That was the last essay of rework. If you're inspired this second, oh, asynchronous sounds kind of cool. Like uh, these people are making it work. The next project, you run it asynchronous, you sign up for an asynchronous tool that's fully integrated and you say, this is what we're doing. And then you, 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 you stay the course for two fucking weeks at least. If you bail after a day or two or a week, you're a wimp. You have to stick through it. Um, anyone who's who's on uh, on TikTok might have seen uh, David Goggins, who's this um, fucking crazy ass um, athlete, who just talks about how it's so easy to be great these days. It's so easy to be great. Why? Because everyone's a fucking wimp. No one can stick to anything that's uncomfortable for more than five seconds. And I think this is, I like to draw this parallel here too to organizational change. It's actually easy to be great in the abstract if you can just stick to it for fucking two weeks. I just, after um, 23 years, I changed my computing platform. I used to be on the Mac. Now I'm calling in here from Windows and on my laptop is Linux. No much just fucking sucked for the first week to try to try to change patterns that I had ingrained into my goddamn fingers and nervous system for 23 years. Oh, it sucked okay. a lot. It sucked a lot. And I went like, I'm ready to quit. Wine, wine, wine. I'm going to go back to Apple. Wine, wine, wine. <laughs> and then I went like, remember David Goggins. Remember David Goggins. It's easy to be fucking great. Just goddamn stick to it. And now I've I'm three years into or not three years. I wish I'm three weeks into my switch and I don't fucking think about Apple at all. I don't think about my Mac at all. Like anyone can push. I don't know if anyone. It is possible to push through even 23 years of ingrained cultural nervous system that has built up um, with a certain predilection of, of something. I just proved it on a personal level for myself with this transition of computing. So if I can change my beloved Mac out to a Linux machine, a Windows machine, you can goddamn try asynchronous communication on your next project.
Uh, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much, David, for uh, coming to talk to us. Uh, this is really appreciated. Do, do you do you agree on uh, us sharing the record uh, publicly? Oh, please! I find okay. it's even better if you do. I don't have to Great. repeat myself. And and if you do share it, I, I find um, the best way for me to boost, and I've been doing this in my Twitter recently, is if you pull small, short clips, because these days no one has the attention span to just follow up on, hey, you should listen to this interview that goes on for an hour. They have the attention span of a fucking fly. They need immediate Definitely. gratification within three seconds. So if you can scissor out uh, bits, then um, then that works well for promotion. And I'd be happy to boost it. And uh, yeah, thanks again for having me on. I mean, I have, uh, I'm Danish. I have a great affinity for Europe and for European entrepreneurs. I really uh, am invested in seeing Europe being more independent, sovereign, in its technology choices and technology um, industry. And that requires entrepreneurs to fucking do the work. If, if we want to have alternatives to American tech in Europe, we need European entrepreneurs to make it happen. Um, so it, it kind of feels like it, it, it's, it's one of those great challenges. Like we cannot keep living like this. We just have hand-me-down technology platforms and ideologies from the Americans. Um, and I say that as someone who's sitting in America right now. Um, uh, so yeah. Very um, inspiring to see um, people in Europe who are willing to test fundamental premises and so on. I mean, the archetype, the stereotype of Europe is it's a bunch of um, people living off past glory who can't realize new ideas, who can't start new things, who find it impossible to do anything. And then you have a bureaucracy that just celebrates itself and its dumb legislation. Not as always dumb. I mean, if they, if they can get Apple, I'll cheer. But cookie banners? Oh my God, what an embarrassment. Anyway, thanks again <laughs> for having this. me on. This is great. Thank you, David. <laughs> Have a great day. Thanks. You too.